I'm Dave Fornes. I'm a utilization and marketing forester with New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. I had my own businesses. I worked for different industries. I worked for Potter Lumber in Allegheny as a procurement forester. I worked for C.B. Norton in Great Valley, New York, which was a dementia mill. Ran their dry kilns. I was personnel manager. Uh, I had my own business where I sold hardwood lumber on a retail mail order basis. Uh, so I've, I've kind of bounced around different parts of the industry and I guess uh, I'm a jack of all trades and a master of none, but I have had the chance to learn that the best way in the world is really hands-on. Uh, college was nice, but you know, you get out of college and you start learning. So with that in mind, uh, I'm going to give you just the, the basics of drying wood today. Why, why do we even want to dry lumber? Let's start there and then we'll jump into technology. So the reason to dry lumber, some of them are real obvious. Uh, increases the marketability. Uh, it makes it lighter so that we can transport it easier. It increases the strength of the wood. Uh, green lumber has a lot of flexibility to it. Dry lumber is a much stiffer and, and, and a stronger product. Uh, you know, obviously increase, increases the value of it. The whole picture is today with houses the way they are, you need to have kiln dried lumber. You need to use kiln dried lumber if you're making furniture for interior use. And we'll, we'll go into that a little bit more in depth, but the, you know, years ago, houses, uh, when, years ago we didn't have dry kilns. It wasn't a problem because we didn't have houses that are tight as houses are today. Today we take our houses and we wrap them in a Tyvek bag and, and you know, there's no air infiltration, no airflow, triple pane windows. Uh, and, you know, you turn on your heating system at the end of fall and, and all of a sudden the relative humidity of your house takes a dive. You know, just maybe the day before it was one of those hot, humid days and you had all the windows open up and all of a sudden you get that cold snap and you close them and that change of, of temperature, that change of humidity is, is really even more harsh than we put wood through in a dry kiln. And because of that and because also in the dead of winter with, with tight houses, you have no infiltration, you have very low humidity, you've got to have it dry. The, if the wood isn't dry, then, then you're going to have problems. And I'll go into that a little bit more, but uh, before we do, let's talk about wood technology. Wood technology is, uh, you know, just the understanding of, of what we're trying to dry. And I guess the best example I can give is uh, when, we f when I first got married, uh, you know, I kind of had a great mother. She, prior to that, took care of uh, everything I ever needed and washing my clothes and feeding me and everything. I got out on my own and, and uh, went to college and then got married. Uh, I, my wife went away for a week and I had to do the laundry. I thought, hey, there's nothing to this. Just throw it in the washer and throw it in the dryer. Well, <clears throat> the stuff that came out of the dryer wasn't the same size as when I first put it into the dryer. I put it on cotton sturdy and cranked it up and, and uh, really over dried the clothes and shrunk about half of them. And uh, the bright side of that is, is by not understanding the technology, not understanding the, uh, what clothes are fabric is like and what will happen to it. I, I've never had to do clothes again at home <laughs> and, and I can appreciate that. Uh, but the, the bad side was I did ruin quite a few of good t-shirts and, and other type of clothing that was made out of cotton that, that, that shrunk. Uh, so we don't want to do that with wood. We want to understand the basics of wood. We want to understand the technology of, of wood technology of what happens when it dries and why it happens so that we don't make those mistakes. The other reason you really got to know about wood technology is even if you dry your lumber right, you need to be able to educate your customer about the proper handling and storage of the lumber after the fact. Otherwise, they're going to do things to the lumber that make it pick up moisture and then they're going to blame you for it later. So we've got to understand the whole process ourselves and also to teach any customers that you're selling kiln dried lumber to so that everybody knows what's going to happen why, and why it happens so that <laughs> nothing else, so that the blame is in the right place. Um, wood has this great thing called differential shrinkage. Uh, it would be a lot easier to work with wood if we didn't have the problem of differential shrinkage. Differential shrinkage is the fact that wood shrinks differently in, in respect to the aspect of the board. In other words, longitudinally you may get little or no shrinkage 
and width-wise you'll get uh, maybe even 500 percent more shrinkage and then in another aspect even even less shrinkage so let's let's drop back a second and and work with shrinkages and differential shrinkage wood is hygroscopic okay it means it has an affinity for water it's kind of like a sponge uh, in that you can dry it out but then again it'll pick up moisture again all on its own or it'll pick up moisture obviously if you stick it in water wood's the same thing if you put wood uh, the lumber that you dried in, in a certain relative humidity and you left it there for a long period of time and it relative humidity stays the same it would equalize with the conditions that it's in and would hit what we call equilibrium moisture content for any given temperature and relative humidity if you kept wood in that setting for a long period of time it would equalize with those conditions and that would be the EMC or equilibrium moisture content percent of the wood doesn't mean that if you're 20 percent relative humidity that you're going to end up being at 20 percent EM the EMC will be 20 percent moisture content of the wood it's oranges and apples I brought I gave you a chart in your handout material that we can look at and I've got a couple of them in there and you you can find them later on there's a table of EMC and then there's there's two different graphs of EMC and what what this graph means is that at uh, these are different EMC percentages this one here being six percent it just says that if we run a dry bulb which means the ambient temperature on a thermometer will be 60 degrees and the wet bulb temperature was 45 degrees if we left lumber in that situation literally forever sooner or later it would equalize out at six percent moisture content more appropriately if you had 70 degrees and you wanted six percent moisture content you'd want the wet bulb to be somewhere around 53 54 degrees okay that's the correlation of EMC to temperature and relative humidity I put another chart in there just because if you, this one's a little more confusing but it gives you the same thing where these arc lines here are the EMC values or the moisture content values that the wood will equalize out at but this also gives you uh, along this axis a dry bulb temperature and uh, along this one is, is going to be your EM uh, equilibrium moisture content percent and this gives you uh, relative humidity as well which wasn't on the other chart which makes it a little more confusing how are you going to find out what your relative humidity and your, your wet bulb and dry bulb are well one way of doing it and the best way is to buy a small hygrometer and put this over the right way you can buy these from any of the forestry supply catalogs I think forestry suppliers has it and Ben Mentals have have them in it and all it is is just two thermometers exactly the same except that one of them has a cotton wick over it which is kept wet in this reservoir and the evaporation of water off of the wick causes the temperature of this thermometer to be depressed or less it takes energy for water to evaporate and when it evaporates, it cools. So basically, you're going to have two temperatures, your, your dry bulb temperature and your wet bulb temperature. And, and if you take those to a chart, it'll give you your, uh, your relative humidity. And then taking that into the chart, you can come up with your equilibrium moisture content. That's important because, like I said, you can dry your lumber perfect. You can get it down to 6 to 8% moisture content so it's perfect for your customer. But if you take it out of the kiln and you don't have a place to store it and you can't control the relative humidity, then you've lost everything you invested in drying that lumber. And if you give it, send your lumber out to a customer, the end result to that customer is that he takes it home and he puts it in, in his garage and it's got a wet floor and the, and the snow blows underneath the door or, or you bring your car in there every day after rain and you import all that moisture into the garage off of the car when it drips off that lumber is not going to be kiln dried forever it's going to pick up moisture content very quickly in fact some during some seasons and 
you got to have a handle on that. What should a storage building be for lumber? You know, in other words, I'm telling you you shouldn't be kiln drying if you don't have a place to store it, if you're going to keep it for any length of time. Storage building should be airtight relatively. In other words, when you're in it and it's windy outside, you shouldn't be able to tell which way the wind's blowing. Uh, you should have a, if you have a cement floor, the cement floor should be well drained underneath. Cement is very porous and it will pick up moisture from underneath and it will bleed up above and, and add moisture. You can't have that so you want to have a pad that is well drained and isn't picking up moisture and then you want to have a heat source. Now <clears throat> you don't have to heat this building up a lot. Right, as long as you don't have air infiltration, you don't have air coming from the outside to the inside, as long as you get five Seven to five to seven, five to ten degrees warmer than the outside, the relative humidity will be low enough that your lumber is not going to pick up a lot of additional moisture, and you can store in those conditions for you know a few months without having to worry about about exactly what the EMC is. So basically, an airtight building with the capability to throw a little bit of heat into it. Uh, we had a storage building at the dimension mill that I worked at where the steam lines that heated the kiln went through the floor of the building and we, we had a trough form through the cement with a grate over the top and the heat from those heat pipes, there weren't any fins on it, with just the straight steam pipes, the heat from those added enough heat to that building that we didn't have a problem. It was a metal building, uh, insulated, and it, it uh, you know, had enough heat and, and was tight enough that we were able to keep wood in there for even as long as a year and not worry about it. The, uh, the one caution I'll give you about metal buildings <coughs> is that if you ever want to construct a building that's a metal building, don't do it unless you've got insulation behind the metal, okay? The metal buildings are, are great tropical rainforests. In other words, if you get a cold day outside, and it's fairly warm inside because you had a, a, let's say a cold night and you had a warm day before and the building's fairly warm inside and this outer skin of the building gets cold, it's just like a dehumidifier. As the air passes o over or around that metal that's cold, water's going to condense on it and it's going to drip off. And that, that obviously isn't going to be the place to store lumber. So if you're going to put a metal building up, uh, I built one for my business, it was 10,000 square foot and we had it insulated when we put it in and that's the only time to do insulation on a metal building because when you screw the skin to it you just screw it right over the top of the insulation and gives you a nice barrier. Just a thought. Okay so EMC we're going to keep track of it. We know that at a given relative humidity and temperature that the wood is going to equalize out to that. We can use our charts to find it out and we get the wet and dry bulb temperatures to take to the chart off of this hygrometer. Okay, how do we determine the moisture content of the board? Got to get my markers out. <laughs> okay, remember I told you moisture content of a board is not the same as the relative humidity. Relative humidity it has to do with how much water air can hold before it's saturated and starts raining. Moisture content of wood is a ratio between the weight of the wood without any water at all in it, which we call the oven dry weight, divided into the weight of the water that's in the wood. So it's the weight of the water divided by the dry weight of the wood and that gives you a percentage which is your moisture content percent. So let me do it this way. If you take the weight of a board presently and you subtract from it the weight of the board if it was totally dry or oven dry, divide it by the weight of the board oven dry and you have to do it times 100 and that will give you the moisture content percent. Or Simply this minus this is, is actually the weight of the water that's in the board divided by the weight of the board oven dry times 100 is equal to moisture content percent. 
Okay? Uh, very simple. What sort of moisture contents do you see? You can get almost up to 150% moisture content in pine. Uh, oak, dead green, red oak runs 85%, 90% moisture content percent, somewhere in that range. What that means is if it was 100% moisture content, the weight of the water in the wood was exactly equal to the weight of the wood itself, excluding the water. Okay, moisture content percent. <clears throat> in with your handouts you can find later I, I've got the average moisture content table of some green woods. Uh, everything from bald cypress down to uh, persimmon so that, and everything in between it would be more logical. And what, what it's saying is that the moisture content varies dr dramatically between the heartwood and the sapwood of some species. Look at, look at cedar here. I'll read it so you don't, because you probably can't see it. Northern white cedar, the heartwood can be 32% moisture content, where the sapwood can be 240% moisture content, with a mix of the two averaging out somewhere around 93% moisture content. In hardwoods, uh, oak, red oak, northern red ours, an average of 80% moisture content, green, 69% in the sapwood, and 80% in the heartwood. They didn't give us an average in there. Uh, so that gives you an idea of what you're starting with with some different species. Okay, so we got a feeling for what moisture content is. I'll work with you a little bit more later on when we start talking about kiln drying of exactly how to sample board and determine its moisture content. But we've got enough of an understanding of the first part of what is, yeah, it's wet when it's green. We want to make it drier so that we get rid of the shrinkage problems and so we make a more stable, lighter piece that's more saleable and worth more money. But what happens when we dry it? What, what differences are going to happen? Well, if we, if we don't understand technology and we dry it wrong, we can turn a piece of lumber into an accordion. It's an actual piece of red oak that was improperly dried. Now, that was pretty violently improperly dried. <laughs> uh, and if that was done in a commercial kiln, whoever did that no longer has a job. Uh, but if we do it wrong and we don't know what's happening, we can cause all sorts of problems. How do those problems happen? Well, the key to drying is real simple we could make this course real short actually if we wanted to is that you don't want to dry lumber any faster than than the moisture can move from the inside of the board to the outside of the board okay you want, don't want to evaporate moisture off the surface of the board any faster than it can be replenished from the moisture that's further inside the board this the second you start exceeding that then you start setting up stresses. When wood dries, it shrinks. Okay? When does it start shrinking? Well, wood has two different types of moisture in it. The moisture that's in between the fibers of the wood, which is called the free water, and then the, the moisture that's actually soaked up in the wood fibers, which is a bound water. Okay? When wood, uh, let's take red oak at 80% moisture content. When it dries from 80% down to 30%, there's absolutely no shrinkage going on because that water that's lost from 80% to 30% is pure free water. The fibers in the wood are still saturated until it breaks below about 30% moisture content. It varies by species, actually it's 25 to 30% moisture content. When it breaks below that, it starts to shrink. Well, what happens if we've got this board here and we start drying the outside of it faster than that moisture can move from the inside to the out. Well, we set up a differential where this outer shell, as we call it, I guess I can do it here, where this outer shell, as we call it, starts to dry. When it gets below 30% moisture content, it wants to shrink. If this wood in the center hasn't gotten below 30% moisture content, then what's going to happen? This is going to try to shrink. This doesn't want to shrink you've got more material trying to be held by this vessel and this gets compressed 
at the same time that this gets stretched out. Okay? And as it gets stretched out, the first thing you see are surface checks. Okay? Now when you start seeing surface checks in the board, then you know that it's drying faster than you really want it to be. Now there, there does have to be a differential. In other words, one of the ways you get water to move from here out to here is by having a moisture gradient. Have it be drier on the outside. Water wants to go from a wetter point to a drier point. That's kind of one of the driving forces of the diffusion through that. Through that. So we want to create it. We don't want to create too much, or we start having this problem where where we have the compression of the inner part and the tension of the outer part. The thing that happens in a dry kiln when that's going on is generally that's the first part of the dry kiln cycle. And it, it's high humidity and high heat. Now, what, you, what happens to lumber when you put it under real high humidity and real high heat? Well, it gets flexible and you can bend it just the way the back of this chair was bent without breaking it. Well, when that happens and that outer shell of the board is trying to be stretched, it does open some surface checks, but it also is flexible at that time and it stretches it out. And if you do that to lumber, you're not going to be happy with yourself later on. Because later in the cycle, <clears throat> this core is going to dry and it's going to shrink. And it's going to want to <clears throat> be held in this vessel or shell, which is already dry and already shrunk and, and dry. And this happens in the latter part of a kiln cycle. And when it's in the latter part, it's high temperature, low relative humidity. The wood's not flexible in that situation. So <clears throat> what will happen is, is that this center core, when it wants to shrink being held in too big of a vessel, will actually pull itself apart and do something we call honeycomb. It'll, it'll just rip and shred itself apart. I've got some pictures of some honeycomb to show you. <clears throat> honeycomb on the outside, as you can see in this one board, if you're not going to surface it down too far and you're not going through that outer shell, looks fairly good until you cut an end off of it. And then you see those honeycomb checks right into the end in that center core that when it finally shrunk was being held in too big of a vessel. If you surface it more, like in doing moldings, you get right into that honeycomb. And uh, if you could find a good use for honeycomb red oak, you could make a fortune. <laughs> We don't, it, it happens when you dry lumber, it happens when you're pushing it too hard in a dry kiln. Uh, if you do it very often and, and you're doing it commercially, like I said, you don't keep your job, you, you lose it. Uh, it. It's kind of fun running a kiln on a commercial basis. Your job is to dry the lumber as fast as you can with just a little bit of damage to it. But the, the line between a little bit of damage and too much is, is very, very easy to cross. It's a matter of sometimes in the beginning of the kiln cycle of only 2%, I mean 2 degrees difference in temperature for, for a day in the first part of the cycle where you can create damages that you can't reverse. And you got a boss on one side of you that, that wants production. He's got to get a load out because he promised it to somebody or he's got to get a load out because he, uh, he's got to get an order out that he's going to use that lumber for. But on the other hand, if you go over the other edge, and, and you destroy all the lumber, it's not going to make the customer happy and sure, sure isn't going to be able to go into the product. So it's, it's a tight rope to, to walk. What, what the art and the science of kiln drying is pushing that edge all the time if you want to be profitable, at least commercially. So you're going to set up these stresses, you're going to set up all of these things that I told you, but you're not going to cross the line to where you damage the wood beyond repair. Now some things once you do the damage to you can't change them. In other words, if you get through the first part of the cycle and you've already stretched that outer shell of that board, there's no way to bring it back together again later on in the cycle. I, I've tried. <laughs> Doesn't work. <laughs> Here's some, some other conditions of honeycombing. Honeycomb checks that I showed you were going like this in that end piece. Well, if you've got a piece that's quarter sawn this is a dead center and, and the annual rings are going like this, meaning that this is a true radius of the, of the log, those checks will go this way. It's just the weakness of the wood of which way it tears itself apart. It always tears itself apart perpendicular 
to the annual rings. Here's the annual rings here, here's the annual rings here. And so if you see those checks, that's actually that situation. You notice this board, here's another problem that you get. This is called collapse. See how the board swings in here? That happened when the first part, when the tension of that outer shell that, that those forces actually exceeded the compression strength of the board and it actually compressed fibers. So when it finally did dry, the board actually had a compression zone in it. Here's some more separation that caused, was caused by something. See how these separations are going with the annual rings? So that's not to be confused with honeycomb check. Quite often that happens because of a problem in the wood. Bacteria oak is a great example of that. Oak sometimes growing in a lowland area will be infected by a bacteria. The bacteria makes its, uh, its wood structure weaker and sometimes when you dry it, it'll separate along the annual rings and, and that's really not the operator's fault or really not your fault, it's a weakness of, of the wood. And it's hard to dry bacteria oak and not have some of that happen. You can smell it in the kiln if it's bacteria infected big time right away. Instead of smelling like oak, it smells like, uh, there's a couple different types of bacteria, but it smells like uh, a, a farmyard in a hot day. You know, it's like a, a urine type a acrid smell and it, it stands out fairly well. A uh, question? Is that, is that the black stain? Does it show up as a black stain? It shows up as, yeah, as a blackish type of a color. Not to be confused with the, 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 the tannic acid reaction stain to metal. In oak, but yeah, it's it's a darker color in there. It's some. Is the same thing as shake? Yeah, shake is any separation of wood along the annual rings. Uh, those of you who've ever sawn hemlock know what shake is. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> okay, we talked about the fact that we're going to get shrinkage in the wood, and those shrinkage problems can lead to all sorts of failure of the wood fiber and and really destroying the wood to where it's no, it makes good firewood, it makes good kindling, but that's not worth the same as, as FAS oak, so you don't want to do it. But let's talk about the differential shrinkage that I talked about before. In, other, in order to do that, we have to understand a couple, three vocabulary words. Longitudinal means the length of the board from one end to the other. Tangential means a tangent, a tangent definition of a tangent is if you have a circle and a line intersects it and touches that circle at only one point, that's a tangent. Okay? Tangent sawn lumber is lumber sawn from the outside of that circle of the log. Okay? In other words, if this was the log, a tangent sawn board would be a board taken from the outer edge of the log. Another, another way is that's flat sawn lumber. It's what we get when we grade saw a lot. The other aspect is radial. That radial side is actually the radius of the log. A radius going from the dead center of the circle out to the outer edge. Radial sawn lumber or radius is quarter sawn lumber. Okay. Now, since this is a radius line, this flat sawn board up here is actually radial aspect here and here, flat aspect here, and as you go further down you can get the radial aspect actually being on the face of the board. The top of the board is more tangent sawn than the bottom because the further down you go the more, more of a radius of the log that board becomes. <coughs> okay, what does that mean? That means that when lumber dries it ends up cupping. And why does it cup? Because in tangent, lumber dries sometimes, when it dries, it shrinks twice as much as it does in radius. Okay? It, and longitudinally, it shrinks almost none at all. So, remember I told you, let's look at this top board on this example. This was more tangent sawn than the bottom, and it shrunk more, so it's concave. And the arc of the shrinkage always is the opposite of the arc of the outer part of the log. So in other words, this bows this way, that's convex, the top of the board bows that way, it's concave. So the board always is going to cup, except for when it's radial sawn or it's quarter sawn. When it's quarter sawn, the top of the board 
shrinks the same amount as the bottom of the board and it does not cup. Not only does it not cup, but it changes less in width from green to kiln dry. And how much does, do, does lumber change in radius versus tangent? Well, here's a chart that's in your, actually I got a couple of charts. I'm gonna go with this one first because it's easiest to see. I underlined northern red oak on this chart. Northern red oak shrinks in radius, uh, let's see, this goes dry to 0% moisture content. Shrinks 4% in radius, 8.6% in tangent, and 13.7% in volume. But it's saying that radially, if you have a uh, you're going to shrink 4% in radius. It means if you have a tabletop that's 33 inches wide, okay, that's going to shrink. If it was 100 inches wide, it'd shrink 4 inches from green to kiln dried. If it was 33, per, 33 inches wide, it's a third of that, so it's going to shrink approximately uh, 4 thirds of an inch or 1 and a third inch from dead green to kiln dried. Now where's that shrinkage happen? I already told you, it's when you go from below 30% moisture content on down. It's a straight line relationship. Going from 30% down to 29%, it shrinks just as much as going from 1% down to 0%. Straight line relationship between shrinkage and loss of moisture content from 30% on down. Yes? Does that shrinkage of 4% occur no matter how slow or how fast you drive? Yes. That has nothing to do, that, that percent is, is a given. And it, it has not, nothing to do, the question was whether uh, the shrinkage rate has anything to do with how fast you dry. If you still get the same percentage, the percentage is fixed. So from 0%, I'll focus this a little bit better. More importantly, from 30% down to 6% moisture content is, is what you're going to see in the swings when you're kiln drying because you're not going below 6%. You've got 3.2% in radius and 6.9% in tangent. And on different species, that varies quite a bit more. Let's look at uh, black willow. 2.6% uh, in radius, 7% in tangent. Much bigger spread. It's, it's, it's more than, well, it's not quite more than three times as much, but it's getting closer instead of two times as much. The wider the variation is between radius to tangent, the more unstable the lumber is. Okay, it, it, as we know, some species are very stable, some species aren't. Let's look at, uh, let's see, I might have to go to my other chart to get yellow poplar is 3.7 to 6.6. .6. Yellow poplar, tulip poplar is a fairly stable wood. Um, hickory. Depends upon the hickory, 5.6 to 8.4. It, once it finally does dry, it's fairly stable. There are some other things in drying in hickory that makes it, makes it a harder wood to work with. But those things we have to understand. And why we have to understand them is if we end up later on selling lumber to home woodworkers and we tell them it's kiln dried and they take it home and they don't understand that differential shrinkage they're going to blame some really bad things on you. In other words if you if I make a tabletop and I glue it up with boards edge glued across the top of the table running down the table like this and then I cleat the bottom of the table underneath with a board running this way all right, I've got a problem because I've got something that's going to shrink very little in length, which is a cleat underneath, tied into and glued and screwed to something that's going to change moisture content in the house even though it was kiln dried, because I told you, even though it's kiln dried, it's still going to pick up and take off moisture. And when that happens, you're going to get a bowing of that tabletop. Another great example of that, and I love it, is when people make kitchen cabinet doors and they edge glue for the face of the door and then they put a cleat across the back to hold it straight. Well, it holds it straight, but as soon as the temperature and the relative humidity changes and the wood picks up moisture, that board just, that door is going to bowl one way one season and another way another season. 
And I, you can tell which season it is just by which way it bows. It has nothing to do with whether you kiln dried that lumber proper, properly. It has to do with differential shrinkage. If you take and, and cleat a longitudinal piece that shrinks maybe only a, a two-tenths of a percent, if you cleat that to the back of a tangent or flat sawn board, which is going to shrink significantly more, then it's just going to do that to you. And, I, and I've had people come back to me when I sold lumber and complain about that. And I had a, a, an article out of Woodshop News or, or, or out of one publication or another that explained why you don't do that. And I'd give it to them and educate them. I tried to educate them before, but if I missed them because it was a busy day, then they, they learned all the same and, and knew that I wasn't just pulling their legs. So that's why you need to know the wood technology part of it. It's also why you need to know the stresses and what happens to it from those. Okay, there are other stresses and other problems that, that can happen. And we need to know, know some additional terminology in order to work with it. Bow, which is where the side of the board actually deflects. We have crook, where you end up having even more deflection, same thing to the side. Twist, yeah I love these. These things, these boards where it, it turns into an airplane propeller. You'll get some of them when you dry, no matter what you do. If you find a use for these, you'll make almost as much money as you find a use for honeycombed oak. Uh, I don't have it yet. Unless you put it into furniture projects that are only a foot long, and then you join it after you cut it a foot long. So that, that's twist. Kink is where you have a, a, a real sharp point of deflection. And of course, cup, which we're going to have in almost all boards when they dry unless, it is, unless it's a quarter sawn board where you're going to have those differential, ch differential shrinkage factors actually making the board bow across the face. <clears throat> what causes all those different things to happen? Maybe I'll put work with this overhead a little bit more. Uh, remember longitudinally I told you wood's real stable. It only shrinks one and a half, two percent. I mean point 0.15 to 0.2 percent from green all the way down to kiln dried. That's most of the time. There is the dead center of the tree where the tree did its first growth that we call juvenile wood. It's also called the pith, P-I-T-H of the tree. That section of the tree does shrink significantly more longitudinally in length. And you see it, a uh, good example is in, if you see a piece of pine, uh, pine generally being sawed all the way through the log and, and including that dead center, this, that's supposed to be a board. <laughs> Excuse my, <laughs> I'm not an artist obviously. Uh, if you have in that end grain the dead center and you have that juvenile wood, quite often you'll see in a dried piece of lumber some actually separation or tear in the wood along that point in a softwood, if you, if you look at it closely. And that's where the juvenile wood tried to shrink and the remaining part of it longitudinally was very stable and didn't shrink and it pulled itself apart. Well that works for softwoods but hardwoods are a little bit more stronger than that and instead of pulling itself apart that differential shrinkage can cause problems uh, along the line of crook where one side of the board might have that be close to that juvenile wood and want to shrink a lot. The other side of the board isn't and it, it, it takes the board and gives it a crook. If it's not too close to it or has just a little bit, it has, it'll create a bow. And that's why NHLA lumber standards are very restrictive as to how much pith can be allowed in an upper grade board. In other words, FAS regulations are, are very strict of how much can be in the board because of the instability that that causes in a board. Another thing that can cause these bowls and situations to happen is quite frankly heartwood versus sapwood shrinkage. Uh, you're going to have more moisture content in the sapwood, it's going to do some more shrinking, it can cause those problems. The, the uh, kinking is where we have more dense wood around the knot that does not shrink as much as a less dense wood further away and that can cause some major deflection like it did in this board here. Uh, the, other, the other thing that can cause problem is different density within the board is if a tree grew on a hillside, this is a hillside, 
trust me guys, this is a tree, okay? <laughs> I, I still draw people with sticks too. <laughs> if this grows on a hillside or if a tree has a significant lean to it, the tree reacts to that by growing unevenly on one side of the tree to the other. And you end up having the dead center of the tree being offset in the circle of the tree and you end up having a situation where the annual rings are much wider on one side and much tighter on the other as a result of that. That causes different densities within the wood and will affect how much the, the board shrinks. It also will have some stresses in it that you notice right away when you saw that sometimes those boards will just grab a shape of their own as soon as the blade goes through them. It's where they're going to come back and hit you sometimes. They, they, they bow so much. Uh, that's caused by stresses within the tree. All of these can be controlled to a certain percentage or certain extent if you have weight on top of your pile of lumber when it's drying. Okay, It's something I'll talk about a little more but I still want to mention it now is that these types of real radical changes in shape and size can be controlled by having weight on the lumber when it dries because at no, that point in time when it wants to show itself in the kiln we're still at the point where we're at high humidity and high temperature. One wood is flexible and we can actually be bending that into a straight board rather than allowing it to twist into a board. And If you don't have weight on your piles when you dry them, right from when it air dries on down through, you end up getting the top three courses that have a lot of twisting, a lot of bending to them. It makes it hard to put into furniture. It takes a product that took nature a long time to grow and you're kind of letting it be degraded by not having that weight on it. You want weight on your piles of some sort. <clears throat> 